face here a little better. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endearing, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. If we all can, can we kneel to pray? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your Sabbath day. We thank you that you have taken a day that we can come spend time with you in your house. Lord, we just ask you for your presence here today with us. We ask you to bless the word blessing to us all today. We just ask you today to be with all our loved ones, the ones that need, may need your healing, just your presence in their life. We just ask you to be with them today. Lord, we just thank you for dying on that cross to save us Good morning, church. Wow, I'm ringing this in. <laughs> it is a great blessing to me to be able to be here at the Coquille Adventist Church again. It's been a while. I think probably three or four years, Tom. Uh, it was, yeah, probably three, four years ago at least. Um, so it's been a while, but it's just wonderful to be back here and worshiping with you. I just love... Uh, I love your worship, and I didn't know that Nathan Pacheco was going to be with you this morning, so that was wonderful, beautiful music, uh, and really enjoyed that children's story. That was great. Uh, I felt lighter by the time you were done, so that was good. Um, I, I was laughing about, about the cans of veggie meat, uh, and, and I happened to have a son-in-law who did a, a long hike, and he, in the hike, was telling me how he put holes into one of these big peanut butter tubs and put a string attached to both ends. He did the Pacific Coast Trail and, and he just had a big spoon in, the, in it and he just walked along with this big peanut butter jug right here and he'd take a spoon bite every once in a while. So there's all kinds of ways people do, do hiking and, and backpacking and all of that. So uh, nothing, nothing surprises me anymore. Um, but uh, it's just great to be able to know that, that God lifts the load from our lives, isn't it? That Jesus is the one who comes and carries our burdens. He says, come unto me all you who are burdened 
and cast your burdens on me and I will give you rest. And, uh, and that is really what Sabbath is about. Sabbath is this day of rest, this opportunity to come and to worship and to uh, experience the, the joy of God's presence together. And uh, I'm so grateful for that. I want to just invite you again to bow your heads for just a moment, if you would, and let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you speak to our hearts and minds. And again, we invite now for you to speak to us afresh. May your word be enlivened in us as we spend these moments together reflecting on what your word teaches us about you and about us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, when I was in college, um, in my second year of college, I, I, I saw this girl on campus and I decided that I would start dating her. Now, um, before I started dating her, um, you know, it meant we had to get to know each other a little better. And so um, what, the first time that we ever did anything together, I walked into the girls' chapel, and the, in the girls' chapel, uh, there were a couple of her friends sitting beside her, and they were watching for me because they happened to be my friends too. And as soon as I walked in the back of the chapel, they were like, because they had saved an empty seat right beside this girl. Now, this girl happens to be my wife today, Verlaine, and I'm thrilled that she's with us and uh, that she's able to travel with me this weekend. Uh, but what I didn't know about Verlaine at that time was that one of her love languages, how many of you are aware of Gary Chapman's five lung love languages? Okay, so one of her love languages, her biggest one probably, is quality time together. Anybody have a love language of quality time together? You just raise your hand. There you go. So what really feeds your soul, feeds your spirit and relationships is quality time together. Well, that's the way my wife is. And so when, when I started spending time with her, I had no idea about this. And so when, when we went out, when I sat with her after that, that program, she says to me, uh, what are you doing for supper? And I said, well, I, I'm, I'm going to supper. And she said, well, what if we were to go to supper together? And I said, yeah, we could do that. And so we went to supper together. And as supper was winding down, she said, are, are you going to the Vespers program over at the church? And I said, yeah, planning to go over there. And she said, well, maybe we could go together. And I said, okay, we can go over there together. And so we went to the Vespers program, and afterwards she said, um, you know, are you going to the program tonight? I wasn't very smart, you can tell. And so uh, she said, I said, yes, I, I'm planning to go to the program tonight. It was a winter fest. There was going to be ice skating on the outdoor arena. It was going to be a fun time. And, and so I said, yeah, I'm, I'm planning on going. She said, well, maybe we could go to the program together. And I said, sure, we can go to the program together. And she said, well, what time are you going to come pick me up? I said, oh, oh, okay. Um, well, I'll be there at this time. And so uh, I met her there, and we walked over to the program and to the arena, and, and uh, we had a nice evening together. And afterwards, she said, well, what time are you going to breakfast tomorrow morning? And by now, I'm thinking, give me a break, lady, you know. Uh, but, but this is the way it went, and this is the way it's gone for 38 years. Um, the love language is quality time together. And what my wife has taught me is that there really is no higher value than being in community. God created us for community. And we find this right back at the beginning of creation in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 to 28. The King James Version tells us, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and do what? Multiply. And so what does it mean to be created in God's image? To understand this, we have to examine the, the, the um, nature of God. And, and we find the nature of God in this text, in Genesis 1.26. God says, let us make man in what? Our image. 
And so the Hebrew word used here for God is Elohim, which is the plural form of the word God. And therefore, the intent of the original text was to indicate that one God consists of a plurality of divine persons. That's why the text specifically uses the plural. And thus, the very basis of God's nature and existence is the relational community between these three divine persons, which is so beyond our, our, our human comprehension how three are one, except that we can understand it in the context of family. And so this is how God creates us, male and female. He creates them. God creates the woman by taking a rib from where? From Adam, from man. Now, did God have to put Adam to sleep and open up Adam's chest cavity and pull a rib out of Adam in order to create Eve? Of course he didn't have to. We know he didn't have to because he didn't have to do that with Adam. He created Adam from nothing, just from the dirt. And so he could have just done that with Eve, but no, he wants to highlight that they are doing life together, that they are two people, but they are are one. They are in community. Just as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are, they are created in God's image. And so Adam says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And that is the beginning of humanity. And so God announces, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and they will become what? One flesh, one. They will become one. And so God's first command to mankind then is to be fruitful and do what? Multiply. In other words, continue to expand community just as God has done by creating them. Continue to expand community. That's what Tom was talking about this morning in terms of building relationships with your community at large around you. He's talking about continuing to expand this community of this church family by connecting with the community at large. In Genesis 2, verse 25, it matter-of-factly states this. It says, the man and his wife were both, this is a PG statement, were both naked, and they felt no shame. What an interesting, odd statement at the end of that story that if you were just reading along, you could just pass over it. You could just pass over it. But due to their oneness, their unity, their nakedness was invisible. And they were free to bear everything before each other and before God without the blush of embarrassment or a shred of shame. And, and they stood in a state of complete disclosure and full exposure before God and each other, and they didn't even know it. They just, this is who I am. It didn't even occur to them to hide. And this was the original mark of authentic human relationships as God intended them to be. And so to celebrate creation and heighten the experience of community, God created a space and time for them, the seventh-day Sabbath. Don't you love that God created a family day for us right off the bat? God said, okay, now I have family, now I need a family day. This is going to be the family day, the seventh-day Sabbath, from now on, for us to spend together. And this first Sabbath time was set aside for the two humans to meet with God, to remember that man was created to connect at set times for the purpose of community, that it wouldn't just happen, we'd have to actually take initiative for it to take place. And so this was God's purpose for human beings. But unfortunately, that wasn't the end of the story, was it? The story didn't just continue on and on from that point. The story takes a sharp turn, a strong pivot in the story. 
as soon as Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, mistrusting and disobeying God, the Bible tells us their eyes were opened and they realized that they were naked. And so they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves. Adam and Eve's first impulse, we, we can't miss this, their first impulse was to conceal themselves from one another in toxic shame and to hide from God and to blame each other for what had happened. That was their first impulse. In the great controversy, we find the destroyer of community. That's who Lucifer is. He's the destroyer of community. Satan's plan of attack was and is and will always be to destroy community. He began in heaven to sow disunity between God and the angels. He convinced a third of the angels to turn against God. Imagine that. A third of these beautiful created beings who their entire existence had been in the presence of God are convinced to turn against him, to break community with God. Satan destroyed community between husband and wife. Thereafter, Eve ate the fruit. What does Adam do? The first impulse of Adam is to say, it's her fault. It's that woman you gave me. If you hadn't given me that woman, this would never have happened to me. It's her fault. He destroyed community between brothers. After killing his brother out of envy, Cain exclaimed, am I my brother's keeper? Hey, he's not my problem. I don't have to worry about him. He's on his own. Fractured community. And thus we see that Satan's kingdoms of this world are always built on dividing people and offering them counterfeit values. If you see people being divided, there is only one source of that dividing. It is Satan himself. That's true in every aspect of our life and of our world. Because that is what Satan instituted with sin. And so we've seen Satan break meaningful connection in every human context. We've, we've seen it in the home, haven't we? Fractured homes, broken homes, homes where relationships are toxic and, and they're not working and they're, 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 there's hiding and there's shame and there's anger, there's blaming, just as happened after the tree. There's, there's fractured relationships and broken commun, com, uh, connection in the workplace, people blaming others in the workplace and, and gossiping about others in the workplace. There are uh, striving above others in the workplace. There's, there's meaningful connection fractured in our local communities, in our state, in our nation. It's part of the national fabric of our world today, this divisiveness, this broken community. It's part of our whole world. Nation striving against nation, as prophecy told us they would. Nation attacking nation, nation trying to overbear other nations. It's part of our world. And there is only one source of this. I wish that was the only place we ever saw it. Satan also decides he's going to try and do this in God's garden, in the church. In the church. God's own space. And unfortunately, we see it happen in the church as well. You know what breaks my heart? What breaks my heart is when, and I'm, I'm telling you this is literally the case, where when we have a church of 15 or 20 people, just a small little church where they don't have enough people to run big programs, they don't have enough money to do big programs, they, what they have is one thing, one thing they can offer to the community around them and to each other. Meaningful, valuable community in relationship with each other. 
loving relationship. And then you see the devil get in there and the, the church is split in two or three different directions. And the whole community knows it because it's a small community. And the devil just laughs. He says, yep, I did it again. I thwarted the creative plan of God in this community again. And it breaks my heart. God's highest purpose is restoring community. That's his highest purpose. And so God, God doesn't stay away when community gets broken. Uh, he comes to the garden there to initiate a face-to-face -face reconnection with Adam and Eve. He comes looking for them. Adam, Adam, where are you? Eve, Eve, where are you? And when they don't answer, he doesn't just give up and go home. God keeps looking. He keeps calling. And finally, they answer, and they answer from behind a bush where they're hiding from God. They're hiding from God because their community has been shattered with God. Their connection with him has been broken because they have disobeyed. And sin has entered into humanity. But we see God seeking them out anyway, searching for them, putting his arms back around them, and yet there are consequences to what has happened. They have to leave the garden. But God sets up a pathway for humanity. And the, the Old Testament and the whole Bible and the history of mankind is thereafter highlighted by God's attempts to engage with humans in community. We see it throughout the Old Testament. And then we come to the New Testament. And we see Jesus comes to restore connection and community with humankind. Notice what the angel said to, uh, in Matthew 1, 23. The angel announces Jesus as Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. Jesus' purpose is to restore community. And so the gospel is all about God taking action in Christ to bring about a reconnection in man's response to God. In John 3.16, says, let's say it out loud together, for God so loved that he gave his only that whosoever shall not but have. Amen. And God gives us the choice. God makes the full provision, but then extends liberty and freedom for us to choose. He does not impose upon us what our choice will be. He does not in any way legislate the morality he so desires us to experience. God simply says, I loved you this much. Won't you please choose me? And if you do, you won't perish. You'll have everlasting life. God's son Jesus personally comes to earth, taking the body of a human for the purpose of building a relational bridge for humans to come back into community with our Creator. Please, think about this deeply in your journey with God. Jesus could have done the transactional work of salvation from heaven. He could have laid down his life, blood been shed, and he could have then gone back to being this eternal, omnipresent God for the rest of eternity. That's not what God decides will reconnect God and us. What God decides will reconnect God and us is that God himself, in the form of the Son, Jesus Christ, will become a human, taking on human 
form, and Ellen White tells us, forever and ever. Think about that. I had some birds uh, in my entryway of my house. They found a little crack about this big between the, the brickwork and the, the, the wood canopy over my entryway of my house, and they decided that in that little space would be a wonderful place to have babies. So they started building a nest in there and left their mess everywhere in the process, and they built this nest in there. Now, I tried to shoo them away. I tried to help them say, you know, see, this is not the best place to build a nest. <laughs> in fact, it actually was, but that won't help my illustration. So uh, I, I tried to encourage them to go elsewhere, not to be there, and not to make a mess of things in that space, but I could not encourage them. And the, the thought struck me, if only I could somehow momentarily become a bird to say, hey, let's go over there to that tree, or let's go over there to the neighbor's house. And they would respond, and they would do that. And, and it hit me. Jesus was so concerned that we would come into community with him and understand what his plan for our lives is, that he actually didn't just become one of us to tell us and show us that. He became one of us forever. To spend eternity in human community with us forever. Wow. Wow. This is so amazing that the Apostle Paul calls this a mystery. A mystery. A mystery to us and a mystery to angels and, and the heavenly realms. And then we come to the place where we discover that restored community brings full identification because of what Jesus has done for us. And so in Galatians chapter 2, verses 20 to 21, we find Paul saying, I have been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. This is the greatest form of identification, to view one's life as being in community uh, with Christ, through Christ, and what he's done for me, and living in his indwelling spirit. This is what God wants us to come to the identity of. This is God's plan for us. And then he says, if you're going to live in this community together, in Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 to 4, this is what it'll look like. If you have any encouragement from being united with Christ, if any comfort from his love, if any fellowship with the Spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit and purpose. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider what? We know this part, right? In humility, consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not to your own interests, but also the interests of others. That, that, that's again what Tom was talking about here during the announcements in terms of connecting with your community at large. Um, and I'm just going to put this out here. That is so hard for the me society that we're a part of to really live. It is. That is so hard. It does not come natural. Without even planning to, we slide instantly into broken connection over all sorts of things. And we fail miserably at doing what the apostle tells us we have to do in order to experience community. Consider others better than myself. Even 
if they're different. But to be united with Christ in community requires us entering into community with others. This is the lesson of the New Testament church. This is what Jesus models for us. And Jesus says in John 13, 34 to 35, a new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. It's really interesting the, how we categorize the things that we think are the hard things the Bible teaches and the soft, lightweight things the Bible teaches. The milk and the meat. I'm going to suggest that what we consider to be the meat often actually is the milk. It isn't what requires surrender and submission and transformation many times. It isn't what brings about connection and community and these principles that Jesus and the Apostle Paul are talking about. This is the hard stuff right here. This is the hard stuff. And we find Jesus modeling it right from the start of his ministry. Jesus could have picked a whole different group of people to build the church with. He could have picked a group of people who at least would get along a lot better, who'd have a, a lot more in common with each other, but, but that's not what he does. Jesus makes it hard on himself to show us what it means to live out what the Apostle Paul is talking about. We would never have chosen these 12 to be in a community together. Yet Jesus saw them not for who they were, but for who they could become together through his love, living in community together. A zealot and a tax collector? A fisherman and an accountant? I mean, all of these diverse people from different regions of the country who were viewed by each different group they were part of as better than the other groups. And Jesus puts them all together to model for his new kingdom movement that it's all about reconnecting in community. And so that's what the early church becomes about. And God shows us this doesn't happen through human effort. What is the first thing that has to take place for this new community of believers, the New Testament church? It's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Amen? It's the Holy Spirit coming upon them, transforming them, taking over their witness for God and causing them to be this powerful force of bringing new people into their community with Jesus. And they do, 3,000 of them in one day, and then daily adding to their number day after day those who are being saved. And the church grows rapidly. And, and the church in Acts 2 was able to overcome persecution and penetrate its world and equip the saints and, and change society in the context in which it was in and, and worship passionately and edify itself in God's word and train up leaders. It was able to be all that Jesus intended it to be. And yet it was so different from what church institutionally would become. Elton Trueblood in his book writes this, Certainly the church was very different from Christianity known to us today. There were no fine buildings. There was no hierarchy. There were no theological seminaries. There were no Christian colleges. There were no choirs. There were only small groups of believers, small fellowships. The early Christians were not people of standing, but they had a secret power among them, and the secret power resulted from the way in which they were members one of another. 
one of another. So what did Satan do? He says, okay, I'm going to go after those people. He uses government to persecute them. He uses religious community, orthodox religious community of the Jews to persecute them. He goes after them. He gets them to turn inward on each other and start backbiting and, and doing things that break down their community together. And that's what you see the, the, the Pauline epistles, the letters of Paul to these Christians, these believers, these churches, uh, speaking to those issues. And what is Satan's plan? What has it always been? What is it? What will it always be? To divide and conquer and destroy community. This is what God is fighting against in the history of humankind and trying to overcome through his people and his church. This is what he raised up Adventism for, to call a people back into community, back into the truth of what it means to be God's people and to be a people who bring people together in that truth. From Scripture and history, God's highest interest is being in community with his people. And this is what God wants for us. I love this quote by Russell Burrell. The present-day church of Jesus Christ should turn every stone necessary to return to the biblical model of church. We are called to live out our Christian life in community. And then I love Ellen White's quote in Ministry of Healing, page 143. I would encourage you to just write that down and go back and look it up. Ministry of Healing, page 143. She writes this, Everywhere there are hearts crying out for something which they have not. They long. They what? They what? Long for a power that will give them mastery over sin instead of being victims of sin. A power that will deliver them from the bondage of evil. A power that will give health and life and peace. Many who once knew the power of God's word, she continues to write, have dwelt where there, where there is no recognition of God and they long for the divine presence. The world needs today what it needed 1900 years ago. And she ends with this exclamation. The world needs a revelation of Christ. They need to meet Jesus. How do they meet Jesus? Through you and me. They meet, a, meet him in our smiles, as Tom was talking about. They meet, a, meet him in the things we do to help them out. They meet him in the kindness we show them. They meet us, meet us, meet Jesus in the non-judgmental attitude and spirit that we extend to them, just as Jesus extended. I came not into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through me, Jesus said. They meet Jesus when we are really living out Jesus in our lives. And then we come to the end of the story in Revelation 21, verses 1 to 3. And I won't spend any time except just to read this, this verse. This is powerful. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is what? With men. And he will live with them. And they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. There's a whole lot of with in that verse. 
the story ends and continues into eternity where the story began for humanity in Genesis. God's number one priority, simply to be with us in community. Wow. I can hardly wait. How about you? can hardly wait for the day that's face to face. But brothers and sisters, today we have the incredible gift of the very person of God in the form of the Holy Spirit dwelling within us. And when we tend to that relationship, we sense his promptings, we sense his guidance, we We can know what he's asking us to do. We can respond to the the ways in which he is trying to guide us and get us to go. And we see the results and we see the fruit of him living in and through us. And the fruit is always the same. Bringing people together in his love. I love your pictures all around the church. Going down every hallway and in your foyer there, these beautiful pictures of Jesus. It is clear walking through this building that the focus and the emphasis based on those pictures is that it's all about Jesus. And why is it all about Jesus? Because He became one of us to come into community with us and be a bridge for us to eternal community with God. What a wonderful God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for your word. Like a golden thread that weaves throughout human history, showing us the ways in which You both created us and you end this story with the beginning of eternity and yet the whole journey through weaving in and out is this effort that you make to bring us back into community with you. That we are created for this. That it's what we most long for. That when it gets fractured or harmed or when there's division That's why we end up feeling so out of sorts and so hurt and so disoriented because it's not what we were created for. We were created for community, an uncommon unity with you, with each other, with others. And it's only accomplished through the love and the grace that Jesus shows us and extends to each of us, we accept it again afresh today. And we pray that you will extend it through us to every person our lives intersect with. May this church community of Coquille Seventh-day Adventist Church, this family, be such a vibrant, spirit-filled, spirit-empowered, spirit-led family based on the word of God in relationship with Jesus to make the impact that you desire to make in this family. We pray in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.